welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. <laughs> and today I'm with Professor Harold Attridge, who uh, has a PhD from Harvard University and was the Dean of Yale Divinity School from 2002 to 2012. And he's made countless con contributions to New Testament exegesis, the study of Hellenistic Judaism, which we're talking about today. His publications are just through the roof, essays on John and Hebrews, uh, Epistle of Heraclitus, Interpretation of Biblical History. And I think you were translating some Syrian text on the god Syrian goddess from Lucian back at, long, long ago. You were translating texts like that. You also contribute to Bibles, uh, scholarly commentary Bibles, like the Harper Collins Study Bible. And so the link for his Amazon is in the description. And check out the, all his tons of books in there. Look through them. You know, find one for a friend, maybe. But he's also, if I'm not mistaken, the Harp because the Harper Collins Study Bible is a very scholarly done Bible version, and uh, you guys have another one coming out, I believe. Is that is that true? Right. That was done uh, by members of the Society of Biblical Literature, which is the main scholarly organization of um, uh, Bible scholars in the country, and uh, that was uh, the second version of um, that uh, kind of commentary. Uh, the previous one was done by uh, my colleague Wayne Meeks. And there's another one that's um, in process uh, right now. Um, so it's uh, it gets updated, you know, every um, 10 to 15 years and um, brings you the latest um, word from uh, scholars, both of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. So That's incredible. So definitely check out the works from, from Professor Atridge on Amazon. There's a ton to look through. And uh, yeah, I definitely recommend it. And so without without uh, any more delay, let's get into the topic, which is Hellenized Judaism. And like the world in which Christianity comes out of, um, a lot of people might not not realize this. People ask, why are, the, why are the gospels in Greek if these are Jewish people? Well, if I'm not mistaken, the, 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 the culture of the first century, this was common. There was a lot of Greek speaking Jews, especially around Alexandria, Anatolia, Syria, even in Israel. And so let's get right into what is this? How do when do the off the bat first question? When do the Jews become Hellenized? Well, the whole process begins with the conquest of Alexander the Great, um, uh, and uh, around three twenty, three thirty to three twenty or so, um, he uh, moved into uh, Egypt. I think around three thirty two BC and um, founded the city of Alexandria there. But basically, um, he was the king of Macedon, uh, northern Greece, and there had been um, uh, tensions and wars between the Persian Empire uh, to the east and uh, Greece up until that time. And um, uh, Alexander put a, uh, an end to all of that by um, toppling the Persian Empire and taking over. Uh, after he died, he was uh, succeeded by uh, several of his generals, and uh, two of the most prominent ones um, uh, were a fellow named Ptolemy, who became, in effect, the pharaoh, if you will, of Egypt, the king of Egypt, um, and ruled from Alexandria. And another one was uh, Antiochus, um, who uh, uh, the Seleucid king of Syria. And uh, people who are familiar with the uh, the books of the Maccabees and the uh, in the uh, apocrypha, uh, uh, apocrypha of the Hebrew Bible, uh, know the story of uh, one of his successors who tried to destroy the temple in Jerusalem or defile it in some significant way, uh, leading to the uh, the Maccabean revolt uh, that gave us Hanukkah, uh, which we're going to be celebrating very soon. So, uh, in any case, um, yeah, the um, the the political power in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the, in the Near East uh, became headed by Greeks. Uh, after the end of the fourth century. And that continued down until um, uh, it was taken over by Rome, but Greek, Greece, Greek remained the, the kind of lingua franca and the culture that went with it uh, was pervasive in uh, all of this uh, neck of the woods. So Alexandria is a, a key point. And as I say, that was founded by Alexander the Great himself and named after him. Uh, and it became a major uh, cultural center on, under the Ptolemies. Um, they did, among other things, uh, establish a major library, um, which was burned down in late antiquity. But in any case, it, it was there during the Hellenistic and early Roman periods. Uh, there's a new one there, by the way, in Alexandria now that uh, was established by the um, uh, the Egyptian government uh, some oh, 10, 15 years ago, 
maybe just a little longer than that. Uh, in any case, it uh, it uh, does does homage to the old uh, Library of Alexandria that the Ptolemies began, and uh, among other things, they collected um, literature from uh, local populations over which they ruled. And the story goes, uh, a story told in something called the Epistle of Aristeas that uh, they wanted the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And that's what led to the, um, the translation of, of the Torah and the prophets and uh, the writings. In any case, there was a Jewish um, uh, component to the population of Alexandria from fairly early on. Um, we don't know exactly when they first started uh, there, but they're there certainly uh, by, the, um, by the second century in large numbers. Um, and uh, after the Maccabean revolt, uh, uh, the Jewish population in uh, uh, the Ptolemaic realm increased uh, when um, the priests uh, who were driven out of the temple in Jerusalem by the Hasmoneans uh, started a temple of their own in, in Egypt. And uh, they served as mercenaries uh, working for the, the Ptolemies. Uh, but the, they were somewhat distinct from the, uh, the settlement in, in Alexandria, which uh, absorbed a lot of the the culture of, of the Greeks, which was the dominant culture of, of the city. And so um, we have fragments of uh, what that culture looked like among the Jewish population that have been preserved for us in various sources, uh, patristic sources, uh, particularly Eusebius, the church historian of the fourth century, uh, did a compilation of materials that uh, quotes from a lot of texts that were written during the uh, early Hellenistic period. Uh, we can date them with some certainty uh, to be uh, probably second century because they were collected and cited by uh, a fellow named Alexander Polyhistor, uh, Alexander the very learned one, uh, who um, did a kind of handbook of um, what uh, the Jews and their culture uh, were like for the Romans once they took over the Eastern Mediterranean after the uh, campaigns of uh, uh, Pompey the Great in 63 BC. So around 60 BC, this guy, uh, Alexander Polyhistor, pulled together this, this sort of reader's guide to uh, Jewish Greek literature. And um, it, then that served as a source for the later um, Christians who were commenting on um, these uh, Jewish authors. And we could see that they absorbed Greek culture in a major way. Uh, they wrote um, poems in dactylic hexameter. There's a guy named Philo, not Philo of Alexandria, the philosopher, but Philo, uh, the epic poet, who wrote a Homeric-like poem celebrating um, uh, the Jewish temple and Jerusalem. Um, uh, there were some other epic poems, too, or people who were using epic meters to do poetry. Uh, and um, uh, these later developed into something called the Sibylline literature, uh, which is uh, a set of uh, texts in dactylic hexameter in Greek. Uh, that is the language and poetry uh, forms of, uh, of Homeric Greek um, that are attributed to the, the ancient Sibyls who uh, do prophetic work for uh, the Jewish people. It was also a dramatist uh, who wrote uh, a fellow named Ezekiel, who wrote a drama about Moses. Uh, that has some really interesting passages in it that seem to uh, suggest a kind of mystical experience that Moses might have had on Mount Sinai. Um, there are apologists. There's a guy named um, Aristobulus uh, who was uh, very much uh, concerned to uh, tell his, um, his uh, Greek-speaking uh, and culturally sophisticated folk in Alexandria uh, that the Jews were really sane and sober people and um, it, whatever kind of um, anthropomorphisms might be in their stories are all symbolic of some uh, deeper philosophical truth. Um, so you have a, uh, quite a variety of, and you have historical uh, texts too. There's a fellow named Eupolemus uh, who uh, writes about um, uh, Moses and uh, Arte, uh, writes about uh, Davidic monarchy and uh, a fellow named Artapanus who writes about uh, Joseph and Moses and the like. So you have a lot of a lot of people doing historical work, poetic work, um, adopting Greek cultural forms, and uh, telling the story of uh, of the Jewish people in a way that uh, will make sense to their uh, sophisticated um, contemporary uh, Greek-speaking uh, friends and, and uh, neighbors in in uh, Alexandria. So that's uh, sort of an introduction to the, the process of Hellenization. It's going on from the, the third century BC onward. Uh, and we can talk about uh, its culmination in Philo of Alexandria a little later, but that's that's the basic picture. So it's so it's. I think, I think, oh, the guy. Oh, the guy. What the heck? The heck? 
Echo, echo, echo. Uh, whoa, that's real bad. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can fix it. I think it's going away. No, it's not. Can you, whatever. I'm just, can you hear that echo? I can't, no. Okay, it sounds really, oh man. Okay, Um. so basically it's safe to say that Alexander the Great, he comes through the East. It's gone now, good. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. He comes to the East and uh, he Hellenizes that region. Well, not he, but you know, the result of what he did, the, the region- he changes the political power that uh, that's governing the region, yeah. Yeah, and then you mentioned again, the Romans come through around Pompey the Great comes and sacks Asia and th that region in the 60s BCE. So right. you sort of have like two waves of Roman and Greek culture coming in and sort of uh, becoming the standardized uh, culture. And you mentioned- Yeah, the, the Greek, the, the, the Greek um, conquest had more of an impact in terms of the language that was used and everything else. Uh, the Romans, at least when they first came, uh, used Latin, of course, for administrative purposes, but they had long since um, been involved with uh, the Greek world, and um, uh, they were quite happy to uh, uh, to use Greek for other purposes. So, now Orphism and Platonism, I, I get get thrown around a lot. Especially you, you mentioned like Ezekiel the Tragedian and Philo, and all these texts that are considered pseudopigrapha. Well, I, I'm the um, the the James Charles Charlesworth text of the pseudopigrapha has a lot of like Orphic fragments in there, Platonist stuff. Where, how does this play a role? And do the Jews, are the Jews in these, in this time period accepting all of this stuff as like legit to them? Um, it, the, um, no, well, it, it, this is complicated, right? Uh, so you're referring to the, uh, uh, the Charlesworth volume, and that's a, a, a place where uh, anybody can go to uh, access all of these texts that I've already been talking about, the fragmentary texts that survive through this process of quotation by uh, different authors. Um, that it's in volume two of the Charlesworth uh, collection. And that was an add-on, by the way, to the uh, Charlesworth collection. Most of the uh, translations of, of uh, the material in that uh, portion were done by uh, students in a seminar at, uh, at Harvard under John Strugnell. Um, so um, a lot of old friends are in that, uh, that collection. But that's where you can go for the people like Artipanius, so or the Orphic fragments. So the Orphic fragments um, uh, are an attempt to uh, adopt a traditional um, uh, religious uh, form of expression from the, the Greek world um, and use them for uh, apologetic and, if you will, propaganda purposes. The same sort of thing that goes on with the Sibylline oracles, which survive in a much larger form um, and a much more extensive form. So you have a, a literary form that's taken and adapted, um, and it's not not an attempt to buy into Orphism. It's an attempt to say um, uh, whatever is good in the Greek world is pointing to what is uh, true and valuable in the, the Jewish world. And in fact, um, one of the apologetic moves that's made by some of these early uh, Hellenized Jews uh, and taken up later by, by Christians is that um, uh, Moses uh, was the inspiration for a lot of things that uh, are essential to Greek culture. Um, not a, a theory that many moderns would buy, but it was part of the apologetic move that uh, Jews were making in this Hellenistic environment to say, uh, look, we're, we're not only as good as uh, you Greeks are, we're probably the source of a lot of um, uh, what you have. Yeah, because it, it says in one of the texts that Moses is the one who taught Orpheus, who then teaches the Greeks. And they're, they're basically saying, yeah. you guys get all this from us. Right. I just think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, the Sibylline oracles or the Sibylline books, which I guess are two different things, do they start off as completely pagan and then become Jewish and then become Christian? Is that the sort of, is that the deal? <clears throat> um, well, yeah. I mean, there's a tradition of Sibylline oracles that uh, you find also um, cited in Rome. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Sibylline oracles, you, you can go and visit uh, uh, one of the Sibylline caves in um, near Pompeii. And, you know, there are, uh, they were there as part of the, the tradition. Um, and um, yeah, you can see them celebrated, of course, in, uh, in Christian circles uh, in the uh, Sistine Chapel, for instance. Uh, you have prophets and Sibylline oracles alternating around the ceiling of the, Sib uh, of the Sistine Chapel. Wow. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, they did come to be understood to be prophetic figures who were outside of the uh, Israelite prophetic tradition, who, however, were inspired by God uh, to uh, deliver the, the same sort of message that the Hebrew prophets were, were delivering. 
uh, so what happens with uh, with the Jewish appropriation of of um, uh, this this uh, literary form and this tradition of prophetic um, speech and prophetic literature uh, was um, uh, to give expression to their hopes and their critique of contemporary society um, and uh, hopes for a better future um, uh, in uh, in a Greek form. So. Interesting. Would you say that Christianity comes out of this Hellenized Judaism? culture yeah different christians uh, well the 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 um the origins of christianity are complicated and complex and uh, there are a lot of things that contribute to, to the uh, the shaping of um uh, christian communities and christian ritual and christian belief um but um uh, what happened in uh in among hellenistic jews certainly played an important role and let me give you just a couple of uh, examples of that um and it, we're not talking about the whole story of the, the development of early Christianity, but highlighting a couple of things where there's some strong connection between what goes on in Hellenistic Judaism and uh, what we see in the in the Gospels. Uh, I want to uh, in, begin that by uh, referring to two texts that I think are uh, particularly relevant and uh, important for understanding uh, the influence of um, Hellenized Jewish stuff on early Christians. Uh, one is um, the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, which uh, stands in the um, the wisdom tradition, beginning with the book of Proverbs and uh, continuing through Ben Sira in the second century BC. And then finally, uh, coming to expression in this Greek form, this was written in Greek, probably toward the end of the first century BC or the beginning of the first century of the common era. Uh, and it's in a kind of poetic style, um, but a kind of Hebrew poetic style. Uh, it's not in dactylic hexameter or any of the meters that are associated with um, with classical poetry. Um, and it has uh, in it some conventional wisdom. It um, uh, also has a kind of theory about how wisdom develops. And it, it talks about wisdom as a, uh, a fine spirit that pervades all things and enters in, into the souls of um, human beings in every generation and makes them friends of God and prophets. So... Um, this understanding of wisdom as a spirit or pneuma uh, sounds an awful lot like what um, uh, the Greek philosophical tradition of the, uh, the Stoa uh, talked about in terms of the divine force that holds all things together. Wow. Uh, uh, when I um, uh, used to introduce this to, to students in class, I used to tell them, uh, think about, um, um, uh, about Star Wars and the Force be with you, and you understand a little bit about what Stoicism was was trying to convey. That is that there is some sort of underlying um, energy or force that uh, is divine and that uh, pervades all things and holds all things together, uh, precisely the kind of language you get in the Wisdom of Solomon. Okay, so that's one little bit, and uh, we're going to come back to why that's important in a minute. The other is um, Philo of Alexandria, whom I've mentioned before, and you raise the issue of Platonism, and um, this becomes very important uh, with Philo. Uh, Philo uh, was uh, an upper-class um, uh, Jewish guy from um, Alexandria, lived from probably around 20 BC. We don't know exactly when he was born, uh, till sometime after 40 uh, CE. Uh, there's one important event in his life that we can date very precisely because there was a, um, a pogrom or set of riots in uh, Alexandria uh, in uh, 37, 38 um, uh, of, the, of the common era. And after that, uh, there were embassies that went to Rome representing the, uh, the Jewish population of Alexandria and the Greek population of Alexandria. And they presented their case to um, the emperor who was uh, Gaius Caligula at the time, uh, who didn't think much of the, the Jewish um, uh, case and sort of dismissed it. Uh, but Philo was the uh, head of the, um, uh, the Jewish embassy that went to, uh, to Gaius, and he wrote a treatise about it called the Legatio ad Gaius, uh, the embassy to Gaius. Um, and he tells his, uh, the story of the, the problems in Alexandria and the, uh, the response, uh, his own response and the response of the Jewish people to that. So we can, and he says he was an old man when he went on this, uh, this expedition. So that gives us some sense of his chronology. Um, he came from a very um, well-to-do family. Um, uh, he probably was a Roman citizen, actually. Um, uh, his nephew, Tiberius Julius Alexandria, had, had a, 
Uh, note the names, Tiberius, uh, as in the emperor, and Alexander, uh, and Julius. Wow. So he's, uh, you know, pressing all the right buttons to say, uh, look, I'm one of your uh, upper crusty types. He, he uh, was standing next to Titus, Titus Caesar when they knocked down the temple. He was standing right next that, to him. That's right. That's right. He was the aide-de-camp to, to Titus. He served as uh, governor of uh, uh, the province of Judea and... Um, uh, the head honcho in uh, Alexandria for a while, and he ended up his career as head of the Praetorian Guard in Rome. So he had a distinguished career in the um, the Roman military. And yes, he was there as um, uh, at the side of uh, Titus at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. Um, and um, uh, the uh, brother of uh, Philo was the alabarch, um, main tax collector. Uh, and the family seemed to have served as... Um, as stewards of the um, uh, the uh, possessions of the Julio-Claudian family, uh, the family of Augustus and uh, his immediate successors in in Rome, uh, the uh, estates that they had in uh, in Egypt, so they were well to do, well placed, well connected uh, with uh, with Romans. Uh, Philo obviously had a, a very um, uh, strong uh, traditional Greek education. He wrote uh, a very high level of Greek. Um, with elaborate vocabulary and uh, elaborate syntax, very different from the kind of Greek you find in, in the New Testament or in the, the Hebrew Bible, for that matter. Right. Uh, so he was a very learned and very uh, sophisticated guy. And uh, he wrote some philosophical uh, treatises. Um, there's a debate about whether these are early in his career or late in his career, but uh, they, they sound very much like uh, philosophical texts. Uh, and he, but his main contributions uh, were an interpretation of scripture. And some of his interpretations are a fairly straightforward uh, retelling of the story of the Pentateuch, and these are called the exposition of the the the, uh, the Torah. And uh, others are uh, more reflective and allegorical. Um, and we there's the allegory of the laws, for instance. Uh, and he wrote a treatise on the creation of the world, which is uh, largely a, an exposition of um, Genesis with uh, some allegorical features in it. Uh, so one of the things that he was doing was uh, uh, continuing the apologetic traditions that you have in uh, Hellenized Judaism, saying that anything that looks mythological or naive in our traditions has a deeper meaning. And so don't get hung up on the um, uh, the anthropomorphisms in the tradition. Um, think about what the deeper meaning is and where where is that deeper meaning? Philo found that deeper meaning in um, in in Plato. So uh, he thought that, uh, yes, the, the um, account of creation could be squared with um, Plato's Timaeus, uh, which is uh, a, a kind of mythological account of the creation of the world that involves a creator god. Um, but the creator god in Plato uh, is subordinate to the realm of ideas uh, or the realm of forms, which are somehow eternal and uh, beyond him. Um, and that would not do for Philo, who remains a good Jew and an observant Jew. So basically what he does is to put the ideas uh, that Plato posited as the, the, uh, the models for the, uh, the world of uh, matter that we inhabit, put those into the mind of God as ideas. And so God thought them and thereby created them. And he gave expression to them with his word, his logos, and that word or logos functions very much in the same way as that uh, pneuma or spirit that you get in, in the wisdom of Solomon, pervading all things and bringing the rationality of the divine to all things. Um, so uh, many people for a long time have pointed out that um, uh, this term, uh, the logos or word, um, sounds an awful lot like the opening of the Gospel of John. And um, uh, sure enough, later uh, Christians also saw that connection and uh, uh, based a lot of theories about uh, who Christ was and how, his re how he was rela related to the Father on the basis of, of um, theories about the Logos or word that we um, get in Philo um, that combines both Platonic and, um, and Stoic uh, elements. Um, so... Um, yeah, that's just um, uh, one uh, example. Um, another uh, example of the same thing, I suppose, or a similar kind of thing would be the Epistle to the Hebrews, another text in which I've worked quite a bit, uh, which um, has a lot of uh, material in it that uh, resembles the kinds of things that Philo does. 
uh, whether there's a direct connection or not, or uh, uh, whether the uh, author of the Epistle of the Hebrews is playing with these philosophical Platonic elements is uh, debated. But in any case, there seems to be some connection there. So, um, yeah, uh, I think it's uh, it's um, clear enough that some some of the things that are going on in Hellenic, Hellenistic Judaism, as uh, Jewish thinkers and writers try to reconcile their biblical tradition uh, with the the wisdom of their day that comes to them through uh, Greek philosophical uh, traditions. Some of that plays an important role uh, in the New Testament and certainly in the development of um, uh, Christian theology in the second and third centuries. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, and, and another thing, someone who's read through Philo myself, he he likes to point out uh, different different areas in the Old Testament where there's an angel who comes and talks to Jacob or Moses or Zechariah, and mm-hmm. he says that mouthpiece, those though that's the logos, that mouthpiece mm-hmm. of God, that word of God coming from these angels, that's the that's the heir of God, the son of basically, and he um he uh, talks about there being an heir to heaven and the the nature of mm-hmm. God you know, stuff like that. Right. He uses a lot of language that gets picked up in Christological um, discourse uh, of uh, later centuries. He even calls the Logos a second God, um, which sounds uh, hmm, a little um, unusual for someone who's Jewish to say. Right. But he's not alone in positing some sort of angelic power in heaven. Uh, And uh, his is uh, uh, a rather philosophical version of of, uh, what others would posit as an angel. I think he even has a passage that has it. He says something along the lines of God has a nature of three. I'm not sure if you remember that or no. I could be wrong, though. Uh, I, I don't remember that uh, specifically. But uh, I mean, Philo plays with numbers all the time. Yeah. And that's uh, in part part of the Pythagorean heritage of his Platonism. And they were Neo-Pythagoreans in his day, too. So if you look at, uh, at that uh, treatise on uh, the creation of the world, uh, a lot of it is spent on uh, the days of the week and what the significance of the number of the days means. So he's he's interested in numbers. Uh, he's he's. Uh, it, I think what you might be referring to in terms of the the three, uh, it, Philo uh, also plays with names. Okay, and is interested in in the uh, connection between uh, signifiers and signified between names and the things named, which is uh, something that. Um, Plato addressed in his uh, dialogue, Cratylus. Um, and we could go into that if you want uh, some more detail. But Philo was interested in this this topic. And so he's interested in the names of God. Uh, and um, uh, the, he's interested in, in the names in part because he believes that God is transcendent as a good Platonist. God is out there. Uh, you, have, you have to believe in God. God is the foundation on which everything is built. But you can't know him directly. And uh, he takes the uh, anti-imagistic um, traditions of the, the Hebrew Bible as a, a pointer in that direction. You can't know who God is. You can't see God. Um, God remains uh, mysterious. But God reveals God's self, says Philo. And here he's you know, simply interpreting text from the, uh, the Bible, uh, the, um, uh, the burning bush or the appearance of the, uh, the three characters, uh, to uh, Abraham at uh, the Oaks of Mamre in Genesis 18. That's probably where you're getting a three. So who are these three? Well, um, think about the names of God. You have two names that run through the, the Hebrew Bible, uh, yod heh vav the Tetragrammaton, and Elohim, the generic word for gods, which can be uh, applied to the singular God. Um, so you have those two translated into Greek as uh, uh, kurios and theos, Kurios, Lord, and Theos, God. Um, And so uh, what Philo says is that uh, what Abraham saw uh, was the word of God and uh, uh, the two uh, instantiations of his power, his potencies, uh, that can be named uh, Lord and God. Mm. So the logos, or uh, self-expression of God that comes from God's very uh, inner being, uh, comprises um, those realities that are named in the Bible as Lord and God. And what Abraham saw was that threefold reality. So it's not a trinity as in um, uh, later Christian understandings of uh, Trinitarian theology, but it's a, a threefold uh, self-expression of God uh, in the world. Um, 
And uh, one other one other thing on naming, okay? Uh, because you have uh, these two names, Theos and uh, Kurios, or Lord and God. But that's not what God calls God's self when he reveals uh, himself to Moses at the uh, the burning bush. He says, uh, uh, when uh, Moses asks him, who, who shall I tell Pharaoh uh, sent me? Uh, and God says, uh, eh asher eh I will be who I will be, or I am who I am. Um, probably future, and probably saying, you're not going to know who I am. I'm in charge, and uh, my my um, my sovereignty over uh, over things is, will remain, no matter what you say or think. Um, but that gets translated by Philo into um, uh, into the expression, uh, the one who is. And uh, Philo says, this is a name that uh, reveals as much as any name can about God. It doesn't reveal a thing about his essence. It only reveals that he exists. A distinction that gets picked up in medieval theology, and you find it in Thomas Aquinas and various other uh, places, that um, one can know that God exists, but you can't know uh, of the being of God unless God reveals that being. That gets picked up, by the way, I believe, in uh, the Gospel of John, and um, uh, where Jesus identifies himself as I am. Uh, so I think that's playing on the uh, the Exodus story and um, the Philonic interpretation of it. Wow, that really answered that because I was wondering what the um, I was wondering about that. That was a really good explanation. Thank you for that. Now I want to get into Paul because by the time we get to Paul, there already seems to be a network because he's writing to churches that are already established. They're not making new churches. He's writing to people who are already there. Uh, I've recently learned about this hypsisterians, these God fearers, these monotheistic. Greeks. Um, I, but is there anything else like who based on the question is, who are these churches that Paul's writing to? What are they? Are they already Christian? Are they something else? What is it? Uh, well, some of the, the uh, this is shifting gears considerably, but some of the yeah. people to whom Paul writes are uh, congregations that he has founded. Um, the Galatians uh, are people that uh, he probably converted in his first missionary journey. Uh, the Corinthians uh, are people whom he, um, uh, whom he converted probably on his second missionary journey. The Thessalonians, similarly, the Philippians. Most of his uh, correspondence uh, uh, consists of uh, letters that were, especially the authentic correspondence, uh, letters written to um, uh, to people that uh, he met on that that particular missionary journey and probably converted. Well, but, let, me, let me just jump in real quick. I, I, let, me, let me rephrase that. Before he goes out there, before he converts them, who are are they? Just normal Greek speaking uh, Jews? Why, why would they? Uh, why would they um, buy his message? Right. Um, uh, okay, and uh, let, let's also note that there are uh, some congregations that he did not found that he wrote to too. Right. Uh, and that would be um, uh, particularly the case with the um, the Epistle to the Romans, uh, which he had never visited. And he, that's why he sends uh, the Epistle to the Romans to introduce himself in a way. Um, so um, were these uh, were some of these people already intrigued by the biblical tradition? Yeah, it's entirely possible that they were. And um, it, the, there is this, um, you alluded to it, the phenomenon of God-fearers. Um, and um, the, there's kind of a theory here that um, uh, you have an openness to um, uh, to Gentiles in various uh, Jewish synagogues, and those Gentiles would come and worship with uh, with the Jews uh, without necessarily getting circumcised, uh, and that was um, a debate. We, we, you know, can you come and do this? Can you be a part of this worshiping congregation without becoming a member of the people of Israel by accepting circumcision? And the answers to that question were varied. Uh, we have a story in, in Josephus about um, conversion of um, the kings of Adiabene. And um, there was a debate about whether they had to get circumcised. And there were different rabbis, if you will, different learned folk who had different positions on that matter. Um, so <clears throat> we also have, uh, in terms of uh, evidence of, of this phenomenon, we have some epigraphical evidence, uh, particularly a, a lengthy set of inscriptions from a uh, a town in uh, Asia Minor, Aphrodisius, uh, which has uh, a list of names who are supportive of the, the synagogue and who are being thanked for their contributions and all of that, some of, some of whom are Jewish names and some of whom are not. Um, and so it looks as if there's um, 
uh, at least in that environment, a collection of, of people who are uh, non-Jewish, are they circumcised? We don't know. Um, who are supporters of, of the synagogue and who worship with the, uh, the community there in some, some fashion or other. So uh, there was probably a foundation for some of the Pauline um, conversions. That is, some people who were already, uh, at least to, to some degree, uh, aware of the God of Israel and uh, attracted perhaps to uh, some of the, uh, the traditions associated with, uh, with the God of Israel, uh, high morality, um, uh, uh, social coherence, uh, service and support to, to uh, people in need, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, uh, they then responded to uh, Paul's message that, um, yeah, there's an outreach, uh, a definite outreach to all people uh, to participate in this reality of God's uh, uh, loving community by becoming uh, followers of Christ. So That's fascinating. So, so there probably was a network of Hellenized Jews in Anatolia and Greece before Paul even goes out there. Is that what you're basically getting at? Uh, well, there was certainly uh, there's certainly evidence of uh, lots of evidence uh, of um, Jewish communities in various parts of of, um, of Asia Minor, uh, as well as Egypt. They're not confined to, to Egypt and um, and Syria. Um, and the evidence consists of both epigraphical evidence and references in Josephus. Josephus uh, Antiquities, I think it's 13, has a long list of um, uh, legal materials. Some people think he might have edited some of it, but I think a lot of it is probably uh, authentic. That um, uh, shows that um, there were accommodations made and uh, support given to uh, local Jewish communities in areas that were controlled by uh, by Rome. Um and there were debates about how much to support and how much to give and all of that. But uh, yeah, they were there. Uh, and that's confirmed, as I say, by epigraphical and uh, archaeological evidence. Uh, there were synagogues in various places. Uh, in, in, there are some um, in Ostia, for instance, that's uh, you know just outside of Rome, the port of Rome. Uh, and that might be significant uh, too for uh, why are they there? Well, they might have been there because there were merchants who came there and um, um, use that as a basis a basis of their operations. Um, and uh, we uh, think about Paul too. Um, how did Paul um, from Tarsus, um, how did Paul get his name um, living in Tarsus? Well, it's uh, entirely possible that, um, uh, and we don't have uh, strong evidence of this, but the, the name is a Roman name, right? Um, yeah, he, the tradition in the book of Acts is that he has uh, two names, Saul and Paul, um, but at least he has one Roman name. And how did he get that? Uh, well, it was a tradition if you were a slave who became a freedman uh, in the Roman system, uh, you uh, often took the name of um, the family that had owned you. So, um, and we know that uh, some people from earlier Jewish wars were sold into slavery and probably deported to places like um, Anatolia. And so uh, my hunch is that uh, Paul's ancestors were uh, uh, freed people, enslaved, who became free. And that was, that was much more doable in antiquity than uh, we, we know from our own experience of slavery in the U.S. Because many slaves had businesses that they were set up in by their owners and they bought their, their way to freedom. Uh, in any case, um, uh, it, it's entirely likely that... Um, um, Paul's own Jewish ancestry goes back several generations in um, in his neck of the woods uh, to a time when uh, Jews were brought there uh, under maybe four circumstances and then made themselves at home and made themselves uh, eventually Roman citizens. So, yeah, because if, if I'm not mistaken, Tar Tarsus is a is a port city with a lot of traffic and trading going on, or is that? Uh, I, I don't think it's a port city, but it's a trading city. Sure. Okay, yeah. that's what I meant. Yeah. Mm. So that that could explain his uh his education, you know, his idea, his uh, multicultural mindset. Maybe I don't know. I'm just yeah, thinking. he's definitely a, a Greek speaker. Uh, he's not he's not operating at the same uh, philosophical level as Philo is, and he's certainly not operating in the same uh, philosophical uh, realm. He's not uh, buying that much into uh, Platonism, although some people have found some elements of Platonism in his work. Uh, uh, more more people have found uh, elements of uh, stoicism in his notion of uh, of the pneuma or spirit, right. um, uh, tying into that uh, 
uh, that business in the wisdom of Solomon that we talked about before. So, and uh, certainly in some of his ethical discourse, uh, Paul echoes uh, some things that you find in, um, in Stoic uh, ethical uh, material. Um, so um, yeah, uh, that Paul is uh, imbued with some form of um, uh, Hellenized Judaism is, is clear enough. And as I say, he's definitely a Greek speaker. Interesting. There's a couple super chats that I want. And if we have time, we can go back to Philo too. That's pretty, there's some stuff I wanted to ask you about that. But since there's a couple of them, people have been waiting, I'm going to throw those up. Myth Vision Podcast, Derek Lambert from Myth Vision Podcast, someone you know. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Go and subscribe to Myth Vision Podcast. Are Paul's rulers, archons of this age in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 8, mm -hmm. humans or demons? Can the archons be seen as humans controlled by demonic gods? Um, uh, I'd, I'd be interested to, to know what uh, what uh, the sense of archon is here. Is this uh, uh, rulers of this age, or are they uh, rulers of of um, the, the archons that we get in in uh, Gnostic sources? Uh, since this is um, uh, Gnostic stuff, uh, <clears throat> First Corinthians uh, two. First of all, um, uh, I think uh, Paul is uh, probably a little bit ambiguous here. I think he probably has. Um, uh, both uh, human rulers and um, their spiritual counterparts in mind. Um, the same sort of, uh, you know, what, what governs a lot of, of Paul's um, imagery and language and imagination is a kind of a apocalyptic uh, scenario. So uh, you can, uh, without mapping things neatly onto Paul, you get some sense of um, what he might be talking about. If you think about the book of Revelation right. and how it talks about uh, uh, political realities that somehow have uh, s some sort of corresponding uh, heavenly support. And yeah, that would not be unthinkable in uh, sources like the Sibylline Oracles, right? Uh, and certainly not unthinkable in terms of other uh, uh, Second Temple Jewish literature. So I always, I always thought that because to, even today, people like, I'm just going to throw this out there, not, not going to get political, but I'm just going to say this for an example. You get people like QAnon who they, when they talk about I don't know, Nancy Pelosi or somebody, they talk about them as if they're demonic, but they're humans, but they talk about them like they're they're demons. And I think Paul's using a similar language as you'd see if people like that today. Is that would you agree with that or no? Uh yeah, but without the 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 same <laughs> political purposes. Yeah. yeah. Uh yeah, Paul definitely has uh, has a notion that there are spiritual powers, all right. Um, and that they influence uh, the world in all sorts of um, uh, ways, uh, and that um, there is a, a dominant spiritual power of which he is a representative, and that, that will win out at the end. Yeah, because I mean, let's just, let's be completely honest here. That that word archon in Greek just means ruler. It doesn't mm -hmm. it's it's used millions of times just for people. Sure. Like the archon of Athens was elected in the year three hundred thirty three B.C. And they don't mean that he's a demon. It just means he's a yeah. ruler of Athens. You know. Mm -hmm. So you can't you can't just say, oh, there's a Gnostic text. Look, it's mm -hmm. these are talking about demons. Therefore, anytime this word's used, it must be about demons. But at the, at the same time, I do see why people are throwing this on to Paul because Paul does have this weird language and he is speaking about spiritual matters. So, you know, yeah, uh, there's uh, you know uh, thinking about things uh, Gnostic, the um, the uh, use of that term. Um, for a specific kind of spiritual being um, develops in a, a context where you have an elaborate theory of how uh, the spiritual world is, is created uh, from a fall of a fault in the Godhead to begin with. And um, uh, there's a, a, also a kind of uh, anti-traditional Jewish element to all of that because the chief archons are the, uh, the creator God and those who, who serve him in some sort of heavenly realm. Uh, so there's a, a demonization of the angelic world, if you will, in, in especially Sethian and Barbellowite Gnostic, Gnostic texts, which are uh, the foundational texts on which a lot of other Gnostic texts are built. Uh, and that's probably not there yet in Paul. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question, Derek. And it has a part two as well. Has Dr. Atridge ever looked into Jesus mythicism any? If so, can you give us his opinion on the idea of Jesus never existing as a historical person? What do you think about that? Uh, the um, the claim here, I think, is that um, Jesus is a um, 
an imaginary concoction of someone. Yeah, Derek's uh, not making that. Derek's saying that's the claim of the mythicist, but yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, right. And um, I, I think this is um, uh, highly unlikely uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, th there are historical testimonies to um, the emergence of Christianity and the existence of Jesus, people like Josephus, uh, even if uh, his text has been doctored up, and people like Tacitus, whose text has not been doctored up. Um, uh, so by the end of the uh, the first beginning of the second century, there are people who were looking back within a hundred years and saying, "Yeah, these are outside of the community of of the b believers." Uh, yeah, this this uh, movement got underway with a um, a prophetic figure uh, whom they don't buy, but uh, he was there and um, uh, he started this whole thing on, uh, underway. Uh, also, the uh, the variety of material that you have it would be different if you had a single simple myth. Uh, that uh, told a story of uh, uh, of an individual doing miraculous things and going off and uh, dying or going to heaven or whatever. But you have a variety of sources uh, that tell different versions of uh, of the story about Jesus, sharing some stuff. And the stuff that they share is not so much mythical; it's it's kind of concrete. It's uh, earth, it's earthy. It's gripping. Uh, the the parables, the uh, provocative sayings, uh, the um, uh, uh, the uh, apocalyptic predictions uh, that we get in um, uh, in uh, the Jesus tradition, as well as uh, the the um, the ethical teaching, um, there's there's a I think a, a hard core of reality behind that. Uh, even if we can't say that the uh, the Gospels are historical texts, they're based on I think a historical uh, series of events that happen. Um, and who would who would create a story? Um, that um, has a hero uh, dying um, a, uh, a pretty horrible death, uh, convicted of being a, uh, a, a criminal, trying to overthrow the imperial, imperial authorities. Uh, this is something that invites uh, the kind of reflections that lead to the theological statements that we get in early Christianity. It's not something you invent. So, Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the, the, they'll, their response to that would be, I agree with you, but their response would be, "Well, those all those sources like tests are so late; they don't know. They're just they're just hearsay." And then they'll say, "Oh, the reason why he died is because he's following the suffering Messiah motif." So, I mean, they there's an answer for everything you throw at them. Yeah, the, the suffering Messiah motif uh, uh, appears briefly in um, in Isaiah and uh, is used for uh, trying to understand uh, why it is that this particular Messiah suffered. There aren't many people around in the first century who are saying, oh, let's wait for the suffering Messiah. Right, exactly. But the um, last thing I was going to say about that was, uh, yeah, that's pretty, That's basically it. Uh, oh, well, that's what I was going to say. I think you made a good point by, by talking about these outside sources because even if some of these hostile witnesses like Celsus or the the Jews, for example, if he did, if this guy was just completely made up, you would think there would be some people contesting his existence, being like, well, "No, nobody ever heard of this guy. What are you talking about?" But that you don't get that. You get, "Yeah, I don't believe in his that he is Messiah," but no. he, yeah, we, he was like, "Yeah, he's real." So I think that's important too. But um, yeah, and you, I mean, you have, uh, you know, on the other side, you have uh, the Pauline testimony. Paul writing within twenty years of uh, the death of Jesus maybe 25 years of the death of Jesus yeah. um, and uh, reporting uh, firsthand uh, experience with, with people who were there with him. Uh, is this all invented too? I don't think so. That's, yeah. and, and then you have uh, the Romans after the uh, conquest of, um, of the uh, rebels in, in Judea um, picking up, uh, there were reports about this and Josephus reports too, I think this, that um, uh, they were tracking down um, uh, followers of Jesus. Hmm. Why? Hmm. They, they uh, according to the reports, they uh, they didn't do anything to any of them. Uh, they found them to be non non threatening, but um, um, they took it seriously that there was uh, that someone that might have been um, instigating uh, revolutionary activity. Interesting. Thank you for that, Derek. I appreciate that, like always. And the next question is from Imposter Sir Spence: Who is Aristobulus of Alexandria? And did he teach Philo? Uh, Aristobulus is one of these uh, authors uh, who is uh, cited by the church fathers like Eusebius, 
whose work would have been excerpted by Alexander Polyhistor in 60 BC. And uh, he was something of a, a philo early philosophical apologist. Um, uh, he wrote probably sometime in the second century. I don't think he was a teacher of Philo. He's too far removed from Philo. He had to have written before 60 and Philo wasn't born until probably 20 BC. Uh, so um, I don't think there's any direct connection. Um, but he was there as a part of the, this tradition of uh, Hellenization and of uh, uh, apologetic literature, uh, trying to say that uh, Jews are, uh, uh, are not opposed to rationality, uh, their anthropomorphisms can be understood philosophically and the like. So Philo might have read him, uh, but Philo had a much more uh, sophisticated and in-depth understanding of Greek philosophy than I think uh, Aristobulus did. Interesting. Thank you for that. Oh, is, is, do we have any? I'm pretty sure we, yeah, we do. We have some of his Aristobulus's works, right? You mentioned. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, thank you for that. Some quotes, some quotes. Yeah. Quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Jason Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners. What parallels can we draw the world building of disenfranchised, demotic speaking Egyptians, vis a vis, Manetho and Apion, and the apologetics of Alexandrians like Philo and Aristobulus? And what can it tell us about their reaction to being an occupied nation via Hellenism and later Rome? It's a lot. Well, that, that, that's a big question, isn't it? Uh, so um, it, this question is referring to a couple of, um, of um, people, um, uh, writers in Egypt who were writing in, in Greek uh, in different times. Manetho earlier on, probably, hmm, I think, second century. BC and Appian, probably first century of the Common uh, Era. Um, uh, Appian uh, is in the crosshairs. Uh, both of these people pop up in in uh, Josephus, his Contra Appionem, his Against Appion, uh, which is a response to um, uh, the the writings of Appion, and uh, we also hear about Manetho in there too. And both of these um, uh, these writers uh, are critical of uh, of uh, the Jews. Uh, for one reason uh, or another, Appian probably a little more so than uh, Manetho, and they they have different theories about um, who the Jews were and um, how uh, how they got underway. Manetho was a little more uh, interested in the early history of the Jews. Appian a little more, I think, in the uh, contemporary social reality. Um, both of them. Uh, uh, and um, so we have th these two figures, and that's how we know about them because there are responses to them, in um, uh, particularly in in uh, Josephus, and uh, uh, some of this probably also is uh, lying in the background of Philo. Um, uh, what their relationship is to demotic speaking Egyptians, and uh, what the uh, what the relationship of demotic speaking Egyptians uh, was to the, um, uh, the royal uh, household of Egypt under the Ptolemies. Uh, those are uh, two different questions. And so we have a number of strands of, of um, things that are interwoven here. Um, Demotic speaking uh, Egyptians are people who are non-Greek, um, who um, are continuing the native language of, uh, of Egypt and uh, writing it in, in a form that uh, is distinctive, distinctive both from the hieroglyphs of uh, earlier ages and also from the Coptic of later ages. Um, and that they are uh, a people um, uh, oppressed, suppressed, uh, uh, used by the, uh, the, uh, the Greek rulers, to be sure. Um, and we have a lot of evidence of uh, what's going on in in Egypt during the Ptolemaic period because of uh, the vast uh, uh, amount of papyri that have been um, preserved because of the Egyptian deserts. And so we can trace some of the interactions between um, uh, between Greek-speaking, Jew, uh, Jew, not Jews, Greek-speaking people in Egypt and uh, some of the locals through some of those uh, those uh, papyri. And it's uh, you know a complicated uh, uh, historical situation. Um, with the exploitation going on, to be sure, and um, uh, but also some sort of um, some sort of conviviality, some sort of um, uh, collaboration going on at the same time. Um, so uh, whether Manetho and Appian represent the Demotic-speaking Egyptians, 
um, primarily, or whether they represent uh, uh, the um, the upper crusty uh, uh, Greek uh, ruling class or administrative class, um, I think is uh, it might be debated. I suspect it's a little more the latter than the former. Although Manitho uh, does want to uh, highlight uh, local tradition in a way, and to to say that. Uh, Yes, the, the tradition that uh, that we represent is is superior to that that the, the Jews are putting on the table. So that's part of the cultural polemic here. Um, but uh, he could make that claim whether he was, um, as his name suggests, a, a native Egyptian or whether he was a, um, uh, a member of the Ptolemaic um, uh, ruling group. And the fact that he's writing in Greek, I think, is uh, probably significant. Yeah, wow, that was a great answer. Thank you for that. Justin Levy, thoughts on the Copenhagen School of Biblical Minimalism. Thinkers like Thompson, Lemke, Gemerkin, Wajdenbaum, or what I'm sorry, Wajdenbaum, who see Greek influence in the Pentateuch. Thank you for that super chat, Justin. Oh, well, that's a big question uh, to, to try to solve in a, a couple of minutes. And in some ways, that's not my specialty, what's going on in the Pentateuch. Um, but, but from my reading of, uh, of uh, material in the Pentateuch, uh, I don't see an awful lot of Greek influence. Um, it, the, um, and when you say Greek influence, uh, when I think of Greek influence, I, I, I think of what's going on in, in people like Philo or Aristobulus or the people who are writing some of this uh, Greco-Jewish literature of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, second century, um, who are adopting um, paradigms and uh, modes of discourse that are quite far into the, uh, the Pentateuchal text that they are interpreting, and they're squeezing uh, the text into that new framework, uh, or imbuing those texts with the material that comes from that framework. So, um, that, that, that's a different kind of process from whatever process was involved in the generation of, uh, of the Pentateuch to begin with. And um, the, uh, the stuff that's in the Pentateuch doesn't look an awful lot like uh, any early Greek literature, doesn't look an awful lot like uh, Homer. Um, you might say that there's some similarity with legal codes here and there, maybe but there are certainly as many similarities with uh, Babylonian material uh, as there uh, might be with uh, early Greek material. So mm, uh, I would tend to be skeptical of seeing an awful lot of Greek influence in the, uh, the generation of the, uh, the Pentateuch, but that's not my specialty. So I'm willing to, uh, to defer to uh, Joel Baden or uh, John Collins on that one. Nice. Thank you for that. Now, just for a couple of minutes, just want to ask you more, a little bit more about the sort of uh, the culture, the time period, what was going on around first second, first century BC, first century AD. Would you do you think it's cop? Do you think Philo's type of genre is a is more common than the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls more strict sort of genre? Um. Uh, well, I, I, I think what we uh, we need to recognize is there's a good deal of diversity in um, in Second Temple Judaism, and um, uh, when you say the it's not simply a dichotomy of, of Philo and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you you also have on the Greek side. We've already mentioned some some of the things like uh, the the wisdom of Solomon, um, or Joseph and Asenath, a novel um, probably uh, written in the first century. Um, and doing some interesting things with uh, with traditional stories. Um, so you you have um, a lot of diversity on the Greek side. You have a lot of diversity on the uh, the Hebrew and Aramaic side too. Uh, it, you have the diversity that uh, Josephus uh, talks about the, the the three sects and maybe four if you count uh, uh, the uh, the rebels as well. Um, but uh, if you, if just think in ter literary terms, uh, you know there's been a a great deal of interest in the last um, oh, 15, 20 years in Enochic literature. Uh, the first book of Enoch, which survives in Ethiopic, second book of Enoch, which survives in Slavonic, third Enoch, which survives in Hebrew, uh, and the connections between them are interesting to explore. And the phenomenon of, of, uh, of uh, 
the Enochic tradition and what it uh, what it embodies, the myth of the Watchers, a, a different version of uh, how sin gets generated and the like, um, and uh, different literary expressions from what you get in uh, uh, 4QMMT uh, or the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice. Well, the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice might be a little closer to Enochic literature. Uh, but in any case, uh, you have a, a pretty broad diversity of uh, forms of expression of uh, fidelity to uh, the heritage of Israel, uh, you don't have uh, uh, you, you don't have it all focused on a single literary type or a single basic idea. So I think we have to take that uh, that into account. Interesting. Yeah, I, that's that's kind of the question. I, I, the way I answered the way I asked that question was like there's only two, but yeah, that's a good point. It's very a lot of stuff going on, a lot of different um, different writers. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, there's one more super chat that I wanted to, that just popped up actually. Imposter suspense. Do you know why ascension and vision of Isaiah were put together? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, no, uh, are you referring to the um, uh, the uh, apocalyptic text, the uh, ascension of Isaiah? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I don't. I don't have any uh, wisdom on that one. I'd have to uh, ask some of my colleagues on that. Okay. Um, so, let's see, the last thing I was going to ask you was. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, do we know for sure if Christianity, when it first came along, was it rejected by other Jews? Was it part of the Jewish culture? Because I know later on you kind of get this sense from maybe the Talmud or, or the rabbinic Judaism that it's just completely heretical and it's just they don't, they don't want nothing to do with it. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a big topic. Uh, when the uh, the so-called parting of the ways took place, um, and uh, you know, for for a while there was a, a theory that um, uh, gained a certain amount of attention and a certain amount of support that um, there was a split between Jews and Christians already uh, at the end of the first century. Um, uh, uh, triggered by the Council of Yavne or, or Jamnia uh, toward the end of the first century, uh, where um, Jewish rabbis inserted the new uh, element of the Amidah or the daily prayer, the 18 benedictions, and this new benediction was actually a curse on the Minim, uh, who are Christians or could be construed to be Christians. And so uh, people who would uh, come to the Minyan and uh, uh, be invited to pray would find it a little difficult to uh, offer a curse uh, on the people that they were uh, sharing dinner with. Uh, so um, that theory was uh, was out there for some time. And um, a number of people have said, well, the, the evidence for it is a little weak uh, uh, for a really hard split between these two uh, religious traditions so early and so so much. Why? Because we continue to see uh, a lot of interaction between Jews and Christians down to the fourth century, uh, till the time when um, Christianity becomes established as uh, the, the religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, John Chrysostom, who becomes um, Patriarch of Constantinople when he was Bishop of Antioch, uh, prior to, it was previously Bishop of Antioch, uh, complains uh, on several occasions about um, uh, Christians who uh, are spending too much time at the local synagogue and they should be spending more time at church. Hmm. Uh, well, this suggests that even in the fourth century, there's a good deal of interaction in the major urban area like Antioch between Jews and Christians. So uh, there were probably different um, different degrees of interaction and different degrees of tolerance and intolerance in different parts of the, uh, the Christian world uh, uh, during the first several centuries of the, um, the Christian movement. Uh, and some people um, um, continue to try to remain faithful Jews while being uh, acknowledging Jesus in some sense or other. There were reports about these folk and some of the, the church fathers who consider them heretics by the time these uh, reports are written. Right. So, um, it's um, it, it, there's clearly tension. Uh, Paul uh, tells us that he, uh, you know, was uh, lashed and uh, uh, harried by uh, his opponents who didn't, didn't believe his version of of uh, of his faith. Um, so that was already going on in the first century, all right. Uh, but there was also continued interaction. So. Now, I'm just thinking about this, and I wonder what your opinion is on this, because the church tradition is that Peter was the first pope, and then, well, obviously not pope, but, you know, the first leader of the church, 
And then after him, he had established in Rome. Was it Clement? I think it's Clement, right? It was the second one, or is there someone someone in between that? I think. It's Linus, you, Clemens, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, and all the such. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, do you believe this is true? Do you think there's some truth to it? What do you think about this? Uh, I think it's uh, probably uh, highly likely that uh, Peter was um, martyred in Rome, um, probably under Nero. Uh, I don't think the um, the structures of ecclesiastical authority had yet emerged that uh, would come to characterize Roman Christianity uh, in another century or two. I think by the end of the first century, you, you at least have an incipient um, hierarchical clericalism uh, evidenced in um, uh, the first epistle of Clement, which maps uh, bishops, presbyters, and deacons onto uh, high priests, priests, and Levites in the Old Testament. So there's a, a structure of authority that's that's emerging. And by the second century, if the letters of of Ignatius of Antioch are, as many people um, claim, to be dated early in the second century. You already have then the emergence of a monarchical episcopacy in some parts of the uh, the Christian world. Uh, but I don't think you have the establishment of a monarchical episcopacy within the uh, the first uh, generation or two in Rome. Uh, I think that uh, emerges in the second century. Yeah, I see. I see what you mean by that. Now, Linus was the name I was thinking of. They, mm -hmm. they, the, the, they they say that he's you know he died around in the late seventies. Do we have any evidence of him being in Rome? Do we have any? Is there any an evidence, or is this just kind of just get passed down and we just kind of have uh, to? I, I, I think the uh, the first uh, uh, bits of evidence we have of of uh, su uh, the succession list that you have in Eusebius in the fourth century, and when exactly they were compiled, and um, how much uh, historical value was to be placed on. Uh, on the earliest stages of them, uh, I think is uh, is uh, questionable. Sure. Um, so uh, sometime by 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 the middle of the second century, uh, you have people who are concerned about um, uh, the co continuity and hierarchical leadership, and so at that point, I think you probably have succession lists being developed, and people saying, "Oh yes, I remember that there was a leader named Linus. Um, did he exercise monarchical leadership?" Uh, in the Church of Rome and uh, uh, after Peter? Probably not. Uh, but he's a name that was remembered. And so ah, we'll put him in as number two. Yeah, because you always wonder, how do they know that this guy Linus died in the year 79? Like, What, what text are they drawing from? Is it oral? Yeah. There's no reason to doubt it because it's not like a supernatural claim. There's nothing crazy going on. But at the same time, it is so like, like we're looking at we're, where's the sources, you know? So you kind of can see why, why you know. There's a, a, a handy little um, uh, paperback uh, called the, the the Dictionary of the Popes, done sometime oh thirty or forty years ago by um, a prominent uh, scholar. I, I forget his name right now, but in any case, it, it it goes through all of the the details on that and tells you where the uh, the information about the individual came from, usually third fourth century uh, materials or uh, Eusebius or whatever, and then. Uh, uh, evaluates whether there's any kind of historical uh, foundation to it. And for the earlier ones, it's pretty questionable. Now I have one more question because I recently was, was watching a documentary about Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii. And they're mm -hmm. talking about in the archeology span dig, they found these relics that are in Latin and they have what looks like to be our, our father, hymns like this one of them says pater nostros and some people are claiming this might be christian so this might be evidence of christians living in pompeii in the 70s in the first century do you mm -hmm. agree with this what are your thoughts on uh, this? i haven't seen the evidence uh i think it's not impossible but um i'd like to see it yeah yeah definitely i'm i will i'm interested to know what your takeaway is from that because mm -hmm. this doesn't say anything about jesus or christ it's just a father thing which would be mm -hmm. like what is this so it's interesting. It's uh, something I'm looking into myself and uh, talking to experts about. And uh, mm -hmm. that's basically it for me. And uh, anything else you want to say? Oh, yeah. Before before we even close out, go and check out Harold Attrich on Amazon. And uh, he's got tons of books, tons of tons of stuff, tons of publications. And they're all amazing. Definitely check it out. And uh, yeah, that's it. Anything else you want to say before we go? No, that's good. Been fun being with you as always. Yeah, I definitely appreciate your time and you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. Oh.